You're welcome back. This is News File, your most authoritative news analysis show. And on News File, we put Ghana first. It's brought to you. Uh, news File is brought to you by the candidate sponsorship of Bank of Africa, strong as a group and close as a partner. They have banking uh, products that are tailored to meet both your corporate and private personal needs. Call them 0244338226. And you will be amazed at the uh, reception <coughs> that you get. On Sundays, the footballers meet at the park and Omutu guys at their joints. The church folks share their grace and friends and family come over to visit. But now, with the MTN uh, special, Sunday special, your Sunday just got more special. For only 50 pesos, you can text and talk all day every Sunday. So, who is it you love talking to? Is it your mom, dad, sister, brother, or the special one? Just keep talking all day, every Sunday, with MTN Sunday Special. Just send yes, the word yes, to MTN short code 5050 to sign up and say welcome to the new world. MTN, everywhere you go. We're coming to you live from the multi-TV studios. This is your Joy News channel, live on Joy 99.7, on Love FM in Kumasi and over a dozen affiliate stations across the country, uh, in London and elsewhere in Europe. This show is available subsequently on ABN Television, the Sky Channel 236. Now, uh, we know that uh, the prisons have been so de have been so congested in Insawam alone, where uh, it was meant to carry not uh, not uh, more than 7,000 or 700 or 800. Uh, it's carrying in excess of 4,000 or so. Uh, and, and I say that is criminal, that, decon that congestion is criminal. Mm -hmm. In Kumasi, where it was supposed to carry uh, less than uh, also a thousand, we are told of about two thousand or so uh, prisoners there, almost getting to uh, two thousand. I'll, I'll get the figures and share them with you because I've shared them with you earlier before on the show. We know that Seth Kwame Boateng of Joy News did the documentary Locked and Forgotten. We know the responses it has provoked, and the Chief Justice is doing such a marvelous job with it. Judges have been made to watch it. Judges have been made to visit the prisons. As we speak this moment, some judges are visiting other prisons. Remand prisoners are being let go, those who do not deserve to be in the prison. Some of them, they have served about five, six times more than they would have served in the prison if they had been convicted. That's the point, and giving the maximum sentence. So yesterday, we are told uh, at the Koforidia prisons, for example, about 60 persons or more got their freedom, thanks to the Justice for All program that has been reactivated. And in the months of uh, the next two months, particular judges <laughs> are dedicated to do only remand cases and decongest the prisons. Mark Woyongo has been preaching the interior minister non-custodial sentences, and that is what led to this documentary. A police officer has gone to the Supreme Court and says there is a part of our law which says if you commit, if you are accused of murder, rape, defilement, and such other crimes, there's no bail for you. That is part of the reason the prisons are congested. Shall we applaud him? or not? I'll start with you. Yes, thank you very much. I think, um, as you said, um, part of the reason is this whole issue of whether or not some offenses are not bailable. Right. I respectfully disagree that there is any offense in this country that can readily be described as non bailable offense. When you look at the section in reference, the section 96.7 of the criminal Procedure Act. This is how it starts. A court shall refuse to grant bail in a case of murder, subversion, rape, and the rest of them. So when the case is brought before a court of law, the first question to ask is, these facts, are they enough to ground a case of? And that has been interpreted to mean if, when you look at the facts, can you just say that on the face of it, prima facie, mm. the facts as presented by the prosecution is capable of grounding a case of so-so-and-so against the accused? 
But unfortunately, when you appear before some of the courts, the first thing is, counsel, is this not a non-billable offense? <laughs> and in fact, you, you, you don't even have to ask, answer the question. It will be answered for you. In fact, it's, it's answered in the affirmative by the one who asked the question. You mean the judge? Well, the court mm. would like not to personalize okay, Because it could be a magistrate. Yeah. Uh. So, and I, I say the, the point that when the Constitution has assigned jurisdiction to the court, and I agree with a judge who said that these jurisdictions are incremental. No act of parliament or any other law can reduce the jurisdiction of the court assigned to them by the Constitution. So if a high court has jurisdiction to hear a criminal matter, why can it not have jurisdiction to hear an application which has been brought pursuant to the exercise of the jurisdiction in the criminal matter? And the, quotation, has, the quotation you just made is from the Republic versus Erico, Erico yes, Dian. Yes, Erico Dian added by, okay. by well, the one I call the Venerable Justice Antonio Boa. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very excellent. Opinion in most cases, yes. He, he spends he, quite yeah. a lot of time looking at the international conventions yes. before he comes to the local yes. law. Yes, because under okay. our laws, we are signatories to a, quite a number. In fact, a lot of them mm. have been assimilated into our, our laws, and they are part of our laws. Then again, when you look at Article 14, it states clearly that where the, your, the police detains you or restricts your movement or arrests you, they have within 48 hours to present you to court. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter the kind of offense. If they cannot present you to court, they can release you. And we know as a fact that the police can grant you what they call police inquiry bail. bail. If the police have the power to do this, why must a court of law feel that his hands are tied behind him? Again, this cannot be an example of an absolute uh, ouster under the Constitution. There's no such a kind of... So I think that with this, and likely, especially in the Human Rights Court, mm -hmm. when you go there, they don't take this particular position at all. They will still look at the facts. Mm. So it's, you, it's not fair when some members of the public, say Kwao Kese mm -hmm. and KKD, got bail even though they are offenses or the crimes they are accused of were under the category of non-billable non offenses. There are those who say it is because of who they are that they got those <coughs> bail. Oh, well, I, I totally disagree. And I think that that is an example of the judges indicating to everybody that we have jurisdiction to hear this matter, and therefore we have further jurisdiction to hear these other provisions. Because usually, they, especially under the government, they said that it is only when you can demonstrate that there has been an unreasonable delay mm. that under these so-called listed non-billable offenses bill must be granted mm. but in spite of that the courts have defied quote and unquote mm. that position held by the supreme court mm. and that is significant because in some cases we feel also bound by precedent the supreme court has said that so i will not even ask myself whether or not these facts before me are the same or similar to the facts that were before the Supreme Court based on which they um, held this way or that way. If we begin to look at it this way, as especially the human rights courts mm -hmm. have been doing, then courts will not feel unduly bound by decisions of the Supreme Court, which they should, but not just because the Supreme Court has said it, but look at the facts before you and ask yourself, are these the same or similar to the Gorman case? Mm. So without prejudice to what the gentleman has filed, and I know that there are other three or so matters also before the Supreme Court. Mm. You see, the good thing is that we have chosen for ourselves this path. Okay. And as I say always, we are lucky to have independent-minded judges. Mm -hmm. And so people, and that is how people see them. That is why almost on every other week or every other day, people are going to the Supreme Court. Right. I would have wished that in conclusion, mm. we set up a constitutional court. Because the Supreme Court has so many cases, mm. including appeals, right. land cases before them. Mm. But I, once again, these constitutional cases are coming up. Mm. Maybe it is for time, it is about time we set up a, a constitutional, constitutional court, court to look at these matters specifically. Mm. Very and the good thing is that we mm. all 
trust the court, and that is the way it should be. Very interesting. You meet some of the judges of the Supreme Court, and they will tell you that I have loads of judgments to write. I have loads of judgments to write. I mean, they are crumbling under all of these things. Wow. Now, you know, when you get into a court, and the examples that I gave of even though the law is saying non-bailable, and these individuals got bail, some will say, these are people who could afford good lawyers, <laughs> or even in certain situations, they can afford you know, a number of lawyers to defend them. And they can make a point to a court to grant them bail. But the indigent, the one who cannot afford, he goes to this chamber, which you say is not supposed to be a messy chamber, <laughs> but to determine law. And he's at the mercy of a judge who simply says, look, this is a non-bailable offense, so you go in. And they go in sometimes for, we know of the Francis A. Jarry case, mm -hmm. over 12 years he was wow. behind. So this is, this is a good way to look at it, or you still believe that we should go to court and just challenge this uh, as and when we get the cases? Well, in the first place, I do not think that what is before the Supreme Court is going to amount to much. Mm. Because all that is trying to, uh, to uh, seek is already there. But what we need, actually, is the orientation of, first of all, our policemen. Yeah. Let me tell you what the situation is like. If a policeman says that, I need to remand somebody, I need to remand so that I do further investigation, so why did you arrest him then? So why don't you <laughs> allow him to do espionage? Because if they are telling you, they don't know, they don't, you don't know that they are telling you, mm -hmm. they come to arrest you when they've gathered the evidence. That is what pertains to very, very yeah. civilized environments, yeah. you know? But now that, oh, let me arrest the man and see if I'll get evidence. So it goes to this judge, who is also very officious in terms of the bend towards the police. Um, I, uh, my, my Lord, please remind this man so that I'll go and do investigations. And that alone is a very, I mean, emotive reason why the person is remanded. So it starts with the police trying to stampede judges to get people remanded. That practice should stop. And the police should do proper analysis and investigations, and when it's all said and done, unless, of course, you are, you, I mean, you need to be reminded because you might want to, I mean, I mean, escape or interfere with uh, evidence and the rest of it. That's the first point. The second point is that our judges should be very careful that they are not unduly romanced by the prosecution. Mm, it's interesting. You come and get a very flowery, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, set of facts, facts yeah. but when you look into it critically, from the four corners of uh, the facts. And then the charge sheet, they don't connect. And if it so happened, you should be bold enough to say that, look, because the, the, the facts do not support the, the, the charge, I'm, at, I'm, 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 I'm minded to um, admit the person to bail. And that is very important. Then it comes to the same judges and the orientation. Um, uh, undue delay. You think that somebody should be, in, uh, is a murder case. And as we have said, non-bailable, although we know it's bailable. Mm. And the person is in prison for one year. How can you seriously say that you've not suffered undue delay? How can you say that? One year incarceration mm. is undue delay for a judge? I mean, that is an aspect that I'm trying to come to terms with. Three years is undue delay. Mm. Somebody will say that, you've, oh, but you've been in prison for just, you know, don't you know it's murder? Mm -hmm. Who tells you that the man who is innocent unless he's proven guilty should be experimenting with jail terms and to eventually comes out that the man is innocent. So I think our judges should look at it from the perspective that if you are not ready to prosecute somebody, I'll let the guy go home with terms. No matter the nature of the case, I'll, the terms will be there, the surety should be in place. And in the present situation where you are both have referred to the government case where the test of undue delay was about two years, what for you would be the time that we should be counting as undue delay? Uh, you've been put behind for one week or two weeks. Is that undue delay? I, I hold a humble started? view. I hold a humble view for indictable offenses. These are the ones that, I mean, I mean, they will not give you bail because of the position of the law. I do not think she will exceed six months because what it means is that then some people are sleeping on the job. Mm -hmm. Why do you have to gather evidence for one year? What kind of thing are you doing? Your, uh, um, uh, your, your, your facts, whatever, uh, going for, uh, what's it called, um, uh, the, the magistrate call for the person to be indicted and all that. What kind of activity are you doing in the attorney general department or the assistant of the police 
who should be so long as three years. So we should question that. Another well, do you hear what uh, Justice Alambrobe says to that, the retired Supreme Court judge? No. <laughs> he says that when they say they are investigating and they remand the person, sometimes it takes so many years, three years and so, and he's asking themselves, um, what evidence are they gathering? Precisely. Is that, is that, are they trying to turn an atom into... I've forgotten exactly <laughs> what he said. <laughs> he, he doesn't get it. It's important. Mm -hmm. And also, I want to make another I mean, observation, which is very important. <coughs> You see, we don't have, I mean, hard data to show that the congestion in the prisons is a direct result of, I mean, uh, these remands which are related to um, indictable offenses. Okay. We don't have the data. Mm -hmm. But what is very important is that the prison authorities too have responsibility. I have to tell you the truth. Because how can you also, having your data, looking at those who have been properly convicted, those who are on remand and all the rest of it. Now, you will not jolt the attention of the Attorney General that for a remand prisoner who is exceeded 15 years, <laughs> it's unconscionable. Yeah. So, therefore, if the prisoner officers are also aware and, and understand the difference between a conviction, properly so called, mm -hmm. and a remand, I mean, some of these things will happen. Do you think if a serious prison officer uh, wrote a letter to the Attorney General that would you care to know that there's somebody who is on remand? for 15 years because your outfit is not ready with a docket and would you want to take steps to remedy the situation we have this kind of situation that we have so the prison officers to have a responsibility that this is not a damping ground mm -hmm. and if the facts suggest that somebody is being i mean i'm kept here for so long a time who we'll jolt the conscience of the attorney general or even the igp and the rest of them for them to do something about the situation. Very interesting uh, thoughts there. Uh, we we'll take a break here, and when we return, I'll take the views of uh, Abraham Amalba and uh, Kweku uh, Baku. Earlier, I was trying to give you some of the statistics about the prison situation, and uh, at Insoam, uh, we're told that it is holding in excess of, of um, it's meant to hold about 800, about 800, and it is holding in excess of 3,000. And out of that population, over 50% are on remand. <laughs> That's uh, how serious it can be. Uh, the Kumasi one is supposed to hold, uh, uh, it is holding over 2,000 instead of 600. Instead of 600. And that's what's happening there. Tamale uh, is holding over 400 instead of less than 100 persons who are supposed to be there. How the people are crammed in there and they are packed as sardines and we understand some have to, you may have to step on someone to get access to the, uh, to ease yourself or to urinate or something like that. And because you cannot do that, you have to keep it to yourself for the whole night until the prisons are opened. So I'd like to say thumbs up to uh, Justice Onyenuga and Justice uh, Hometou who are, and the rest of them who are going around under the special dispensation granted by the Chief Justice for some of these people to be released. We'll be right back. Thank you very much. This is News File. And uh, Abraham, just uh, about yeah. uh, a week ago, I went to the police station. A uh, client who had just been picked up over some commercial matter and had been invited. Actually, three police persons went to arrest the person. Then we told them, look, the person is busy working. The person will report later. Then they said, oh, they come at 10 o'clock. They had come very early in the morning. The person was there at 10. Between from 10 to up to somewhere 3, 4 going, when I had to now go there, the police officer, I, I asked the police officer, he's been here all this while, she's been here all this while. You haven't taken the statement. You just threw the person to the counter back. What is going on? He says, oh, but you know we have the power to hold the person for 48 hours. I said, well, are you interested in holding the person for 48 hours? Or you want <laughs> to know the person's side of the case? So I say the police are most guilty in yeah. the congestion situation. But let's move on to the real issue here. What do you say about this rate? Will it help? But I also want to take a bite on okay, the police matter. You see, go on. in Ghana, the first person who reports at the police station is mm. absolved mm. of the crime. Mm. 
So the one who they go to pick <laughs> is now, that's the modus operandi of yeah. our police. Mm. And it's weird. So as we sit here, if I go to the police and say, you something slapped me here, they will pick you, they won't even investigate to know whether it is true or not, the veracity of it. This also is one of the bane of the congestion that we have. And I think that the police administration should begin to think about how they go about their investigations. But, you see, I'm aware that the Supreme Court has made some pronouncement on this type of rate that yeah, is in court. Mm. Um, I don't know the angle they are going, mm. but it is important that the Supreme Court does not render, uh, unless they want to change their own uh, ruling, mm. but uh, mm. per mm. inquiry, mm. they, should, they should be looking at uh, the government case to see whether they want to stay on it or not. Mm. But in that government case was the issue of that when there's unreasonable delay, mm. but no definition has been given as to what is unreasonable delay. Is it two days, three days, four days? What is unreasonable delay? I will tell you my own experience. Where the murder case came to me, the relatives were asking that I go for bail. I asked them, how long has he been in, in police custody? They said six months. I said six months will not get you a bail. Mm -hmm. I just told them. So they kept pressing. I also kept delaying the tactics. Playing delay tactics, we got to nine months. I went. The judge said no, because, according to the judge, that there's so much work for the attorney general, <laughs> and that <laughs> this is not the only <laughs> case that the attorney general <laughs> is holding or is dealing with. Mm -hmm. So I shouldn't expect that nine months is so long. Exactly. And that is the psyche of our judges. Mm -hmm. So it is important that we begin to understand that the prisons or the cells are the second homes of those of us who are free. Hmm. It's not everybody who is there who is actually guilty of an offense. Right. Right. And that you can be framed and put in there. Right. And so at, today you slept in your house, tomorrow yeah. you'll be there. Mm. Be yes. yeah. All it takes uh, sometimes is to have a, a police friend mm. or a friend who knows a police <laughs> officer. <laughs> now, now he spoke about the 48-hour uh, thing. Yeah. We'll, we'll look at the Constitution right. Review Commission uh, yeah. had yeah. actually proposed that we reduce the 48 hours mm. to 24. Yeah. Government rejected it. it. Used to be, yes. Government rejected it. But even the 48, sometimes it's so disconcerting that if they know that Monday is a holiday, mm. then they will arrest you on Friday. And then throughout up to Monday, they will tell you that the 48 hours imp um, implies that, that term implies mm. that then it should be 48 working days. In fact, when a court of law is sitting. <laughs> In fact, you could be picked on a Thursday on afternoon. Thursday, Thursday afternoon. afternoon. Yes. So by a close of uh, Friday, yes. it's still not 48. Yes, and then, then Saturday, Monday Sunday, is there's no work. <laughs> it's Monday is holiday. You are still there. Okay, go but on. But I, I think that, quickly. What, what, as we say, the police still have the power to release that person. Yes, on bail. On bail. Okay. And, and I, I actually right. forgot. I had dealt with you earlier. Quickly, yeah. you are the <laughs> okay. last to speak I on it. Yeah. I haven't mm. studied this uh, lately. Okay. So I really do not want to comment on something I haven't bothered to study. Right. Uh, I'm sure it will go on for a while. Right. Uh, but the other one, the mm. documentary triggering. Uh, yeah, locked and forgotten. Yes, I think it was a good documentary. Mm. We should credit, salute the professional journalists who were behind it. And as for the prison congestion situation, it's a long standing story. Mm. We've discussed it here before. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes makes me sad in terms of our personal as experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, he talked about we people sleeping like sardines. We did mm. it. We went through that. One, your head goes this way and the leg comes there. That's where we can create space mm. for ourselves. You know, so it's a good exercise and I hope it's sustained because it's, it's been going on yeah. and off. Mm, yes. Under the PNDC, they had a prison congestion, de decongestion team. You know, Johnny Hansen, the late led it, came, they decongested the prisons and all, and then we rebuilt it. So to be honest with you, uh, I'm hoping it will be sustained. It's mm -hmm. a very good exercise. All those involved need to be encouraged to do more. Thank you very much, Abdul Malik Kweku Bako Jr. And uh, this is where we draw the curtains on today's edition of News File. And I've been excited, uh, very, very happy to have had uh, Samuel Atatia who is a lawyer and MP for uh, Chim uh, Bwakwa South.
uh, he says the court is not a messy seat mm -hmm. chamber. It is where we debate the law. And I agree with him on that. Abdul Malik Wekubaku Jr. is editor-in-chief of the New Crusading Guide newspaper. And uh, he uh, is our regular, our regular panelist. Yao Pong is legal practitioner and also lectures law at the Central University College. Abraham Amalba is also a private legal practitioner, lectures, and also is with the NDC legal team. Earlier, we had Nana Ato Dazi, former chief of staff, who is also a private legal practitioner. Have a good afternoon. The show is up again at 9.30 tonight. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.